Hello, my name is Andreas Klostermann, and I'm going to tell you a lot about brainwaves and how we as Python programmers can use our skills and tools to explore our mind. First, a little medical disclaimer. I'm not qualified to give medical advice on, um, on certain medical conditions or treatments thereof, so whatever I say about uh, these treatments, take it with a grain of salt and consult a qualified medical doctor if you need advice. First of all, what are brain waves? Well, as you probably know, your brain cells all commute. Brain cells all Uh, your brain cells uh, communicate via electrical signals, among other things, and the side effect of this signaling is that they send out electromagnetic waves. And if you sum all this, uh, these potentials from all the brain cells up, you get a sort of summation signal that you can measure on the scalp. But as I said, um, every brain cell counts a little, that means you can't really isolate single cells. You can't even often, uh, you, can't, often you can't even resolve uh, certain brain regions um, with medical devices, with medical EEGs. That is sometimes possible, but also quite restricted. Uh, the, the signals are extremely weak and noisy, and virtually every facial muscle has a stronger signal than um, the brain itself. Uh, relatively early on in the 60s, uh, researchers asked the question if you can actually, um, if you can actually consciously control your brain waves. And they did the, uh, some experiments on cats. They trained the cats to exhibit certain brain waves. They just rewarded them for certain patterns and they were uh, able to uh, control the patterns by just holding very still. Uh, later, these cats were used in experiments to test um, epileptic medication, or, or rather the opposite uh, medication that, um, that uh, elicits uh, epileptic seizures. And it turned out that these cats were actually more tolerant um, for these med medications than other animals. So they were more, uh, more resistant to epileptic seizures. Over the decades, um, it has turned out that several studies uh, really showed um, uh, an effect for neurofeedback as a s therapy for epilepsy, but it's not really um, all that common today. Um, epilepsy also is a very severe, uh, severe condition and so it's not really amenable for us as amateur brain scientists. Um, the more important application of neurofeedback is in the treatment of ADHD, which is an attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, which is characterized by a short attention span, by high impulsivity, among other things, um, the consequences are, for example, higher risk for depression and other conditions, lower academic achievement, worse social skills and delinquent behavior, higher risk thereof, rather. Uh, this is not a complete discussion of ADHD because I don't have the time for it and it's a very complicated condition. Um, it turns out that these, um, th that the research around ADHD is highly relevant to general mental training and general uh, training of, for example, mental focus or skills training. Um, there's one part of the brain which is uh, especially relevant and responsible for, uh, for the executive functions of the brain, for impulse control and for all sorts of positive features, uh, and that is the prefrontal cortex, which is uh, right, uh, right in the front, as the name implies. Um, and also this is uh, one of the most human uh, brain areas because 
Um, other animals don't really have all that developed in prefrontal cortex, um, and that makes us pretty human. And if you ever saw a dog, uh, he can't really hold his attention really long, except with very good training. Um, the pro there is, um, it turns out that all sorts of activities have been shown to actually train the prefrontal cortex. For example, meditation, um, as in the form of awareness meditation, which was propagated by uh, Buddhism mainly, but uh, in psychology, it often is called mindfulness uh, training or mindfulness-based therapy. And uh, in the most basic sense, you would, for example, concentrate on the sensations of your breathing and you would try to focus on them but after a few seconds especially when you're a beginner you will just uh, drift away and think of something else or your uh, or your mental voice will uh, go on and uh, your concentration is away then you bring it back again if you notice it which can be minutes later um, so it's a very simple to describe training, but very hard to do. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a signal, hey, you're going off track, hey, you're, uh, you're, you are not focusing anymore? And that is basically the idea of neurofeedback training. So a computer could give you feedback on your focus state, uh, but, uh, but it has to have some way of telling if you're focused or if you're not focused. So um, that is done with uh, EEG sensors and the big problem with these devices often is they are very expensive and not very practical to use. The, uh, the company called New NeuroSky has developed an ASIC module uh, which is sort of a board with a chip and it does all the amplification and translates it into a digital signal also already with some preliminary analysis, which is relatively simple, but works quite nicely. Um, it is used in several devices, about a million or so, uh, the company claims. Uh, for example, these board games, if you ever saw them, here you can control physical objects with your brain. Uh, they never really uh, took off but, uh, and, and several people also said that uh, this is um, sort of bogus, but the chip inside at least uh, probably does uh, exactly what it, what it is supposed to do. Um, here, that is a very nice device. It's a headset with cat ears, and these cat ears are mounted on, uh, on little motors, and according to your focus state, uh, these motors move, uh, which is sort of popular in uh, cosplay. <laughs> um, this is a MindWave mobile. Several versions of this exist. Uh, one is a USB dongle wireless thingy uh, where you have a USB dongle and this communicates with the headset. Uh, here I have a mobile version which has a Bluetooth connection which is, which is actually more useful. But they all talk the same protocol because they all have the same chip. Um, the protocol tells us about the raw signal, attention and meditation values. Uh, these are values which are computed inside the, ship, the chip. NeuroSky doesn't really tell us how they are doing that, that uh, but I think it's about uh, frequency bands. I go into that later. And these attention and meditation values are just between 0 and 100. And uh, this protocol itself is designed to be extremely hackable and uh, therefore it is very concise. And for example, if you hook it up to an Arduino, the Arduino is able with just reading a few bytes uh, to tell if the user is paying attention or not. Um, frequency bands, I'm going into that later, uh, what they mean, but uh, essentially they, they are values computed inside the chip itself, uh, so an Arduino wouldn't have to do a Fourier transformation. Then there is a detection for blink events. As I said earlier, facial muscles all have higher, uh, stronger signals than um, brain cells. Uh, so it's nice to 
know if there's a blink going on. Poor signal detection, uh, essentially when the device isn't on or if the device uh, detects no signal connection, uh, it's nice to know. Uh, now we are moving on to the live demonstration, if it works. And the first thing is uh, to make a connection via Bluetooth. And I have to excuse myself because before I went into this uh, room, it, I had a connection and I hoped it would uh, stay that way. But yeah. now I have a connection. So, also my reveal, iPython live reveal doesn't really uh, work as well as uh, expected. Here I have a code sample. This is a feedback loop, sort of coroutine, um, which I'm going to use later to uh, do some feedback. Um, I have written uh, a parser um, that writes a protocol, uh, reads a protocol, and uh, then it, uh, well, the loop here uh, reads something from the Bluetooth socket, then feeds it to the parser, and then it yields back to the function, uh, to the other function. So. And this is the most simple way of It's a most simple form of feedback in which I just print out the last attention value. If there is one, isn't really that fault tolerant, but I have to, so. Now I'm working. Now the value is between zero and 100. And it's somewhat more difficult to do when you're standing up. <laughs> Uh, the first time I gave this talk, I was wondering um, why I had such a such a bad signal. Uh, but it turned out that really um, the, the whole time I was uh, practicing for the talk, I was uh, sitting down, and then I, uh, at the presentation, I stood up and wondered why I didn't got, got a significant signal. Uh, but it's really so that the problem is when I'm standing up, um, my face muscles are a little bit more stressed and. Uh, the brain is in a in different state of mind. It has to stay upright and balanced and stuff. So the biology sometimes confuses stuff. And also Reveal.js is also, yes. Can you measure stage fright? <laughs> Do you think I'm frightened? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not afraid of you. <laughs> uh, now, and if you have live code, you can also mess up the code. Now, this is a live animated graph. Uh, the way I am controlling attention is um, by sort of um, mindfulness meditation. I concentrate on my breathing. I try to consciously put this uh, focus lever on or this uh, button. And also I concentrate uh, on the area below my eyes. Um, that sort of, that, that seems to work reasonably well. Now, uh, they, the, the NeuroSky module computes a meditation value. Um, I won't comment on if it's really meditation. For me, what works for meditation is I think of something cute or adorable, uh, a smiling, <laughs> smiling baby or a baby animal, and that sometimes that mostly works.
Now there is something um, called brain-computer interfacing. Uh, Brain-computer interfacing means you would use this EEG device to control something else. Uh, essentially, at the ba most basic level, you would want to have a button. But the problem with these both, uh, both of these uh, values is you should not only have a way to consciously push the button, but also avoid pushing the button. And that is uh, much harder to do. Now I'm going to show you the, the raw data um, also in the same manner. Yeah, that we had a few frames which were relatively good. I'm now going to show you what happens when I move my eyes. And as you can see, every muscle is uh, stronger. Uh, now I'm going to clench my teeth. <laughs> and I can abuse this signal uh, to do some sort of uh, yeah, brain-computer interfacing, but it's not really brain, it's really a muscle. And uh, EMG is normally uh, electromyogram, and you would use other sensors, but this also works. Uh, and I do that by passing, so I'm taking about um, a quarter of a second worth of data. I compute the first order difference, takes absolute, and then I mean it. Um, so in this case, I'm, I'm having, uh, what happens now? Now the Bluetooth is again down. That is a good sign, actually, because then usually it makes a connection. If you wanted to program a real consumer-friendly uh, app, this kind of, uh, to automate this kind of uh, connection is, would be high on the list to make that work. Hmm. So I have two demonstrations left, and I, how, how much time is left? Okay, then I will do one more time, one more try to get it back working. I essentially need to wait for uh, the blue um, LED to to turn uh, to not blink anymore. And now it works. So on the top is the computed value, um, and I have a cutoff in this. Uh, in this example, I have a cutoff of 30, and then I can more or less consciously, uh, or mostly consciously, turn the switch on or off. In more sophisticated applications, you would use machine learning, especially if you really wanted uh, to use EEG data and not uh, EMG data. But also, this is a one-channel device, so it has only one one channel of um, of, um, of measurement and Usually, brain-computer interfacing requires more, uh, more data, but you can do some, some of it with just one channel. 
I now have to go back to frequency bands in a more sophisticated analysis of EEG data. Um, I, I think I didn't explain EEG, that was electroencephalography, or GRAM. And uh, the idea between frequency bands is that, well, the brain waves tell us something about what the brain is doing and how it's doing it. And different frequencies will tell different stories about the brain, but it is a very, but the relationship between uh, what the frequencies mean and uh, how you measure them, it's, it's very, it's very uh, complicated. So I'm just giving a very superficial um, overview of, of it. The boundaries uh, here I've taken from Wikipedia. Below for, we have delta waves uh, associated with deep sleep. We are there, then there is uh, four to seven um, hertz uh, set of waves are drowsiness and hypnosis. Eight to 15 alpha is, uh, alpha waves are associated with relaxation and uh, closed eyes. 16 to 31 in this case is better. Um, attention is, is associated with attention and wakefulness. In ADHD therapy, uh, new feedback, you would uh, try to um, uptrain beta for attention and downtrain theta. Um, there are other modes, there are other ways of uh, detecting attention, but that is one of them. Um, here I have a code example. Uh, there is a library called PyEEG that can compute various stuff, among other things, uh, the power, the power of uh, relatively of uh, well, the power of certain frequency bins. Here I have different frequent. Uh, here I have different uh, frequency boundaries. Um, they were this vector was uh, noted in the documentation. Here I am calculating the, the, these uh, values from about one second of data, and you can try um, different um, lengths of time. On the one hand, you want, uh, want the frequency computation to be accurate. On the other hand, uh, you want to give immediate feedback and not after five minutes of uh, running. Here, I, uh, here I'm destructing this vector again into different uh, values. And then I'm displaying just the beta versus theta, beta versus theta. And now the Bluetooth is acting up again. And I'm not going to turn it back up because, uh, back up because this, is, uh, this was the last demonstration. Essentially, I can um, consciously uh, manipulate this value but it's a bit more tricky than um, the attention and meditation values. Now, on to my, one of my favorite uh, topics, which is data science. I designed a little um, experiment. No, not reacting again. Um, at home, I recorded uh, two sessions. One is a baseline session, one is a training session. During the baseline session, I tried uh, to not pay a lot of attention, which is really difficult because uh, paying attention is a very physiological um, thing and happens all the time, especially unconsciously. So I just took five minutes of that data and uh, I counted on that I was more often distracted. Uh, then I pulled, uh, I recorded 15 seconds of mindfulness and I wrote both of these, um, these, this data to files. So I just took the Bluetooth data and dumped it into a file and later I can uh, pass it again for data analysis, which means it's a bit more reproducible. So if I have a bug in a parser and I had a bug before um, and then I correct it later, I can uh, reproduce uh, my data quite easily. So, uh, there is, uh, here's the data as a histogram. 
I've taken several values of our time and, um, well, especially in the top graph, uh, there are two modes. I think that is a data quality problem. So if I wanted to be more sophisticated about it, I would have to exclude eyeblings and uh, situations where I am not uh, entirely uh, confident um, about the signal, because if you move the device or if you move your head and stuff, then uh, this affects also the data. Uh, we have a general sense that uh, the, the below, the bottom graph is a bit more to the right, but it's hard to tell. Uh, we could do a t-test, but um, as always, Bayesian know it better. Um, there is a, git, there's a there's a toolkit on GitHub which does that uh, with PyMC as um, with PyMC as an M Markov chain Monte Carlo engine, and if I do that, I think I have the code here. Yes, uh, import best best plot, and then I just sample the model. I already did that, and then I can show this uh, graph. So uh, it's diff I don't want to go into too much detail on this, but essentially uh, these two histograms show us the posterior belief about uh, what the model believes where the mean values should be. Um, the 95% highest density intervals, Bayesian don't like, uh, Bayesians often don't like it when you call these uh, confidence intervals. Um, but uh, here in this case, they don't overlap, which is a good thing, but the bottom uh, interval is certainly a bit broader, and that is because I just had 15 seconds of recording. So, on to further ideas. Um, you could explore brain-computer interfacing some more. As I said, it's very difficult to really design workable switches that work between sessions and between, even between people. Um, another thing you could try is uh, watching MOOC videos and uh, monitoring when you, are, when you are getting out of focus. You could make actual games. Uh, there are game mechanics. You could uh, makes a game mechanic that uh, a character jumps when you concentrate, or you could make a shooting game where the, the jiggle of the gun is uh, controlled by the attention, so the more uh, attention you are uh, paying, uh, the, the steadier your aim. And bioelectric identification is you make basically a password, you, say, uh, you try to identify the person just by their brain waves. Um, I can recommend several courses, but as I'm uh, already a bit over my time, I don't explain this anymore. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, we can do some questions. Yes, uh, so first of all, uh, thanks very much, Andreas, uh, especially for his courage, which is actually worth an extra applause, making live demos, yeah? So, so um, uh, everybody having a question, please line up. There are two microphones from each side. Please line up and ask your question, please. If I want to start doing this right now uh, and doing what you're doing on stage, uh, is the NeuroSky thing what I should get, or what do I, I start? Uh, I think there are several devices out there, but uh, the NeuroSky Mindwave is probably the cheapest. And from what I have seen, I, did, I don't own these other devices, but this is really one of the most uh, useful devices. It has a dry sensor. You don't need gel or moisture here to uh, make it work and just needs a triple A battery with good for safety and it's also wireless. And I think the Mindwave Mobile is the way to go. They, are, they have a more comfortable headset which is about double the price and but, but for example if you wanted to use it while making sport or even sleeping uh, that would probably be, be a better idea. How much does that one cost? 
I don't know off the top of my head, but it's at least double the, the price. So this costs about 110 euros and the other one about 200 or 300. Okay. So I think the next question goes. Uh, so the question I had was as far as he was mentioning a resolution or trying to get better detail, is that something, the fact that you could have, would, would a, se a second sensor work or a, I mean, if you basically took what, took what the nearest guy one and effectively had a separate sensor on a sec separate part of the head, would that help, or would that? Are you looking for? Is there needs to be more? Uh, essentially, more to get more channels with these devices, I think you can't really mount several of these devices yeah. on your head. That would like, look kind of stupid, but uh, I think they 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 offer these uh, modules as um, developer kits, so you could. Uh, if you are a hardware, if you are a hardware hacker, you might be able to hook something up, but that's complicated. So, if, so, so, so fundamentally, it's to, if the, when you say the different channels, it will be different parts of the brain you're looking at. Rather uh, yes, than you would get more spatial information, but all, that is also a bit restricted. Okay. okay. Thank you. I've got two questions. First is, how much data per second or minute in bytes does this device produce? Um, Roughly. I don't know off the top of my head, but about five or ten kilobytes. So second. we are talking kilobytes. Um, I think, yes, but that's mostly the raw values. You, don't, you can really discard most of it if you don't want the raw values. And have you locked the brain waves while drinking beer? Uh, not yet. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I have a question. Uh, would it be possible to trigger different switches with different feelings? Uh, that is certainly a machine learning question, and I don't even know if you can uh, develop a reliable switch in, uh, with just one uh, channel. Um, that is certainly more, this requires more work. It's really, really something of a classification and not, especially not overtraining on the conditions that you are actually using. Um, and, and you, you have a danger there that you, uh, that you overfit on, uh, your current thoughts. So there might be, you might try to distinguish between two different thoughts and, then some other sorts do the same thing, and you don't know it beforehand. It's, it's, it's really tough, I think. Thank you. Yes, so thanks again, Andreas Klosermann, for his talk. <laughs>